Okay, I think we have two minutes left. We will wait for a while, but we're 33 right now, so people are getting connected. And I think in these two minutes we will see more participants. And just um, very soon we will start. I will say a few words. Mm -hmm. oh. <coughs> So this is my watch. I will look for the time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so the the presentation will be at the three dots and on the top, isn't it? So. Yes, I can upload it right now for you to yeah. be sure that we have everything. So I will turn it on. Yeah. Okay, and it seems it's 3 p.m. at I, my watch. I see the, on, on, on the below, I see the, the pictures of the people. Yeah, that's fair. Good. Good. Yeah, Good. Yeah. Uh, so let us start. Meli kolegos, aš labai džiaugiuosi, kad jūs prisijungiat prie mūsų šią dieną. Ir šiandien mes turim puikią galimybę sveikinti profesorių Janą Vandaiką iš Tventės universiteto, daugelio knygų autorių, tyrinėtą, kuris nagrinėjo ir formulavo tinklaveikos visuomenės skaitmeninės nelygybės, skaitmeninės demokratijos ir kitų labai įdomių fenomenų modelius. Mes galim sveikinti profesorių šiandien virtuolioje paskaitoje. Ir šiandien aš labai kviečiu visus pasinaudoti progą ne tik išklausyti profesoriaus paskaitos, bet taip pat užduoti klausimus. Po paskaitos mes turėsim galimybę bendrauti ir užduoti klausimus. Jeigu jaučiat, kad ne viską pavyksta išreikšti anglų kalba, tai būkite drąsus, kalbėkit lietuviškai, aš padėsiu išversti. Būsiu visą laiką kartu ir galėsim kartu po paskaitos taip pat pabendrauti. Bet turbūt visi susirinkom klausytis ne manęs, o profesoriaus, taigi jam ir perduosiu toj pat žodį. So, Jan, the floor is yours. Uh, take control and we are listening. Okay, take control. That's this one. Well. Yes. Uh, thank you for the inv invitation, uh, this remote invitation. I hope I'll still be close. I will talk today about, for you about my main concept, the network society and what it means for communication research. I will uh, make it timely by uh, talking about the Corona crisis currently going on in the world, because this is a good manifestation of the network society today. What will be the program? Of course, I will say what actually is a network society. Uh, and then I will like, make the links between the network society and this so-called Corona or COVID-19 crisis. The main thing I will say as a first uh, manifestation of the network society that it's actually unstable you see it in all of the kind of the world, kind of crises, thing going very fast and back again. You also talk about connectivity and fragmentation. You see more connectivity in the world, and at the same time, you see all kinds of fragmentations like owned communities, so called bubbles, echo chambers are talking about, and this is sometimes linked with the rise of the social media. My, one of my main uh, topics of research is uh, digital inequality. My main topic of my publications is actually the digital divide. 
I will propose today that actually the network society tends to be unequal, unequal. That is not necessarily the case, but the way it goes now, it goes in the direction of a more unequal society, unfortunately. That network society might be more democratic, but in the same manner, I could say that in the moment it looks more like undemocratic. If you today see things like in the United States and the elections, it's not a good record what the social media bring over there, for instance. The network society has also to do with culture and uh, daily life using of people. And then we see that the people using digital media is still difficult, is still different in an on-demand way. And that actually connects to the network society on-demand daily use. The main conclusion of that first part of my lecture will be that networks are more trend amplifiers, things already going on, than uh, revolutionizing society and completely topping up society we already have. After this uh, lecture about the network society, we have to say what this means for our discipline, communication science. For some people, that's not interesting, but for you, I hope it is. It means something for how things would be important for you, what kind of research uh, traditions and uh, strategies will be needed, and in which way we will involve. Will we still go all to the digital media or still digital traditional media still important? That's my view, the last one. Okay, we go with the program. The Network Society has, was actually, according to Wikipedia, coined by me in the 1980s as a particular society. It's a modern society. That means after the Industrial Revolution and is based on an infrastructure of social and media networks. Not only media networks like the internet, like digital media, also, of course, social networks. Because all of my work, there's always an integration of sociality, social things, and the media things. Not only technic, technic, technical things, all, only social things. Well, those infrastructure of social media networks characterize a particular mode of organization of a society. It's mainly about the organization of society at all levels, individuals, relations of individuals, the groups, organization, and even society at large. Well, you see here some covers of uh, my books and the last one of the book, The Network Societies to the right, was just published by Sage Publications and it contains all new things happening about the digital media, the rise of platforms, uh, so uh, Facebook, uh, data economy, big data, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, all the new stuff is into it today. Some of these things will be shown in this lecture. Uh, what society at this moment is a network society? Not all of the world is actually a network society today. An increasing number are those network country societies. That means those who have high access to internet, telephony, and social media, and not only media related, but also what they are doing. That's actually much more important. But the large part of your day, you're working, educating, social relationships, all these things, and public discourse, public debates are going online today. 
However, in the developing countries, you see that still people are not in, in this structure. They still are what I know, mass societies who came after the Industrial Revolution. And uh, when we, for instance, look at India, clearly uh, cities like Bandu, by uh, uh, Bumbang, uh, Hyderabad, Calcutta are a part of a global network uh, society. But when we look at the countryside and to the shanty towns in the cities, you see still a mass society where traditional media are still important, increasingly using mobile phones. And that's actually the stepping up to going to a network society also in the, such a developing society. In mass societies, the traditional media and communities are still the dominant and there is not online courses in education or whatever. When we look at Lithuania, your country, in my view, it's clearly a network society. When we look at infrastructure, that's for sure, because we see we have about the same kind of mobile broadband uh, connections about the same as the rest of Europe and better than in the average of the world. Individuals using the internet in 2018, that was uh, close to 80%, just like in Europe. In my country, it's 80, 90%, 90, 80%. And uh, when we look at ba bandwidth, go using the internet, you see, Lithuania is in, on top of it because it has a very high uh, bandwidth uh, connection. I hope that's true, but that's what I found in the ITU figures 2018 and 17 and 19 too. It's also a matter of what you're doing all day. Online uh, activities are becoming more and more important also in your uh, country, and that's important. This is also something you have to know about this uh, view of the network society. My competitor is Manuel Castells. We also wrote a book about the network society in the 1990s. What are the differences between what I talk about the network society and he, he does? In Manuel Castells, networks already are the main units of modern society. He says, well, networks are the main parts of modern society. Second, he says that these networks are pervasive and there is no opposition inside networks. He says, we have created a machine which is dynamic, full of opportunities, but it's controlled by no one. Well, when I read such a site, well, I think this is clearly technological determinism and I don't agree with this because in my view, the net networks are not the main uh, units of society, but still individuals in Western society or collectives like an Eastern society are the main uh, units of modern society but increasingly linked by networks. And that's the new thing, they are linked by networks, the relationship. The second differences with Castells is that in my view, network structures are, have internal oppositions. It's not uh, one way, no, no one way dimensional thing. They are created by human peoples and they can also be changed by humans. According to one of my uh, theories I like most, structuration theory. So there's always conflicts. It's going different directions in you. They can be more democratic or less democratic, both of the way. Those are the conflicts between Castells and Jan. Well, 
I want to be very timely too today because network society is reflected in the current corona crisis. If we see the reactions to the corona crisis today, we see how the network society works. I have three main observations today. First, network societies are better equipped to carrying on work, education and social relationships than mass societies, like those in poor and developing countries. Imagine that today we would have no internet, then we would have no education in most schools of high education, university, because that was not allowed. Or we only had lecture uh, rooms of uh, five people or something. So imagine that we didn't have the internet today. So you can see that in about 30, 40 years, the internet is so important for our society. And it now helps us to more or less continue doing things, working education in our society. The second is that online communication is OK, but it's not fully satisfying for most people. Physical contact is really needed. You see it, but most people are already budding up with all this online coursing and I want to see people outside. I want to meet them again. Uh, physical contact is needed and even our own students I remember. Well, mostly they thought, well, no, I have no class. That's OK, no class. But now they're asking for class. Please give me lectures. So that's the first time in history I've ever heard of a student saying this and that's what they're doing now. There are many societal trends now reinforced. That's my third observation. I will talk about inequality, the loss of freedom and democracy today, and impoverishment of communication, like for instance, online course giving, and many more. So I'll give a lot of uh, examples about these trends today. I start with uh, the role, the role picture, the system as a whole. Then I have to say that the network society is in principle unstable. It, networks are made to make us more adapt to a changing universe uh, environment. But coping in doing this less to a lot of unstability of the things we already did before, the economy we had before, politics we had before, social relationships, the things traditional we had are now making unstable by using the internet and other digital media. If you look, for instance, for the economy, we see enormous volatility of the stocks and the currency markets it's going up and down more faster than before. You got flash crisis on the stock exchange in New York and the like and in one second. Billions of uh, of uh, values have gone down, then they come back. In politics, you see drifting voters and moods very, very fast within uh, a year, perhaps. And more of them forced by the social media. They're doing these things that are one of the main mechanisms of these big, big changes. If we look at social relationships, we see our friends can be updated every day. We can up, uh, find new friends and de uh, make them out of your list too. When we look at cultural, you see the rise of disinformation, fake news, social media rumors, flash maps of young people and other people going to in a within an hour on a place as, to go for a demonstration or to have a, a party or to routing or whatever that can be organized via Facebook, for instance. So that means that our society 
in several domains is becoming more unstable by using these very fast media, digital media and the internet. When we look at the corona crisis, we see more and more disinformation going on the internet. And it's now very uh, bad working, how it's working there today, because it means, for instance, that today when we are at the phase that everybody has to be a, a, a vac vaccination for, for the disease, then uh, people refuse to do this. About one third of my own uh, uh, population of the Netherlands doesn't want to have this vaccination and they have a, a lot of problem with be, uh, being looking locking locking out at home at home and not going out so there are demonstrations and the like and when we look about these things discussion about these things in the social media you see a lot of this information that is growing growing and growing for instance, when we look at uh, uh, the United States at this moment and the election uh, ideas there, that Trump still thinks that he has won the election. Well, that's not one thing. About 50% of his own uh, voters are still, 70% even, think they have won the uh, election, that he has lost, won the election. And this has only gone down because they got it from their own echo chambers in using the social media. So while networks are equipped to uh, adapt ourselves to the environment very fast, they make our systems also unstable. Now we go to another dimension the social dimension. We see the rise of connectivity, but also fragmentation in the social network society. Of course, connectivity is rising very fast. About 40, 50 years ago, we had a six degrees separation observed by Milgram that in six steps, every American would have to connect connections with another American, only in six steps on average. Now, I know a lot of research now that when using the internet and the social media and the like, the numbers of steps you need now are three to four. So our society and our world is connecting, is hyper-connecting at this moment. And this is one thing of of the, what's happening, but the other thing is actually fragmentations. Uh, we see that uh, all kinds of public spheres are split by people who are using only with their own discussions and not with another one. You see uh, in the literature what is called echo chambers, that people are talking about their own views, in fact, and s support their own views. For instance, the rep rep Republicans in the United States are only discussing now with their own kind, their own Republicans, Trump fans in their own chambers, and that's their own reality today for them. And they don't know, know any reality about the Democrats, for instance. That's another echo chambers that's also discussing each other. There's a completely split in that society, United States, between two splits, two, one demo democratic and the other republican. Well, in terms of marketing and the like, it's used by Mr. Paris, the concept filter bubbles, that we only uh, follow our own views on the internet, especially. And that's not a good thing because that leads when, for instance, uh, this information appears, then it goes only stronger and stronger and stronger. Actually, but it does not mean that there is no uh, public domain anymore, no things together anymore. 
for instance, when we look today about the corona crisis, everybody is talking about the corona crisis in the world, also on the internet. So other views are still to be viewed, especially when most people still use a newspaper and a television channels. So they must still see what's happening only when they have with inside of echo chambers, they still use it too. So that's another kind of it. So that is still global public spheres, but they are in the same time fragmenting. The relation between these two trends are the thing for the future to be happen. How can we solve this problem with all these trends? I always want to say, how can you solve them? Uh, well, for this thing, principally, there is no solution because connectivity and fragmentation are sides of the same coin of networks. They are both makes things bigger and smaller. Extend and reduct. That's two parts of using networks, both scale extension and reduction. So in that way, it cannot be changed. But what can be done is that people are more aware of what happens, <coughs> for instance, of the process of those chambers and bubbles, that you are actually in a part of a bubble and a chamber, that you have to look outside of your bubble to find other ideas, perhaps that you can talk to your own neighbor who's in another bubble, and people will have the need to do this too. When we look at the social media, it would be very important that they will work at an other way than they do today. But today, all what happening is there is a business model. The business models of advertisement of the social media reinforce all this process of uh, fragmentation because that gets you more hits and more uh, opportunities for giving advertisement for people. people. So we have to do something about these social media. I hope there will be other social media in, in, in the future, more than Facebook and the like, but that's not easy because they are now the big ones. And for instance, you can use another, I'm in favor, for instance, of a social media, which is based on uh, subscriptions, a very small subscription of five euro or something a month and you don't have no advertisement anymore and no privacy problems. But when I ask this to my own students in my lecture halls, more about 10 to 15% want to do this. They don't want even five euro a month <clears throat> to have a better social media without all these problems I talked about, price, privacy, advertisement. So others do want it, but those other social media are very small and not a good uh, <clears throat> uh, op um, other thing to take. Uh, well, uh, the social media have to be regulated and that's what the governments in the whole world are now trying to do. Not successful yet, but uh, the first things are happening in the European Union and in America even too. They want to deal with the five big companies controlling the world, Google, Facebook and the like, and to have more regulations. If you want to more about this, you have to read my book because I have some solutions for that too. <clears throat> now I go uh, to another social aspect that uh, network society tends to be unequal too. When I started with uh, my research of uh, digital inequality in the 1980s, I thought, why? The internet, that will be more, in, more equality in the world because now information is now free and easily available for everybody. You don't have to go to the library anymore. You just use a Google search engine and to find something. So that would be more equality. Now, 25 years older, I know it's the opposite, of course, that happened. That using digital media 
and the network leads to more inequality, unfortunately. It is unequal in several respects our society today, and that's a negative thing. So the main conclusion of my last book about the digital divide is digital inequality that might be motivation, access, digital skills, usage, supports social inequality. So when social inequality is increasing in the world, and that's a fact, social and economic inequality, using digital media only supports this. And it becomes become, because the difficulties, the, the, the differences between people are only reinforced by using digital media because then they need more digital skills and those are new and the like and the like and the like. This is the main um, message of my book, The Digital Divide. When we look, for instance, at the whole society, there's a picture here to the left. It's a, a three part of society, which is talking about. And in the middle, you see uh, a dense network connection of both media and social networks. And those are habitated by the so-called information elite. You are all part of the information to lead people uh, now looking for this lecture. Because you have the most social connections usually and the most media connections today using the Internet all of the day. However, afterwards you have the, the, the part of the participating majority, which is about 60% of the population which are using the internet which have also social networks social connections but uh, less than the information elite and outside of course you have those people who have less connections <clears throat> and have less digital media access and skills and those are people who mostly have a poor, having a lost jo lost, low job and the like. And those people also have less digital media use. And so in this way, it tends to be <coughs> that using digital media, the, report, the, the differences between the elite, the majority and the excluded are still going bigger, bigger and bigger. Okay, it's now. I try to take control, but I can't animate anymore. I do doesn't work anymore. Uh, okay, now it works again. Well, this is not a, a good uh, message to give. It's uh, very positive. It looks like it to be, but. Uh, in all of my books, I always give solutions for this because there's something you can change in this because actually <clears throat> it is not needed. It's not a ne natural necessity that using digital media leads to more inequality. It could be the other ways around. When I started in the 1980s, it could be when we would be in a, a society in which inequality was rising, more equality between people, like a time we had, for instance, after the Second World War, that was the time that people with low uh, incomes and education came up. The difference were, were less than as they are now. If we would in such a society in which there would be more equality, digital media could support this too. That's my uh, main conclusion too. Uh, an example of using the digital divide in the Corona crisis. It's the same message, I can tell you, the same story. The crisis 
is made worse by using digital inequality. Those who have no or bad access today are searching and finding less information about the disease and don't know how to handle it and they don't know how to and they don't follow the measures of the governments and the health authority not that more than those people who have more access those who have no or bad access communicate also less with others about dealing with the situation and getting social support for instance via social media that's also the case those are results of a research we did recently in the Netherlands by my colleague Van Dusen. It was already published in the Journal of Medical Internet Research. The main uh, conclusions are that people with positive internet attitudes, good physical access, good digital skills, used more information about the disease and did more communication about this disease in social media and the like, and benefited much more about the usual information and communication, which is available at the internet today. People with unequal digital skills and unequal, not enough traditional literacy showed the highest effect COVID-19 is a new disease and it's unknown and complicated and all these doctors and the like to talking about it are using very difficult, difficult medical language, which is only reinforced in using it on the internet. So people cannot know what they are reading actually. They need more traditional literacy that is reading and writing and they need digital skills too and when you don't have one of them or both of them not then there will be a problem that's what we found even in my country with a high relatively high digital skills and relatively high traditional literacy the most important observation is the last one here the elderly the people with low education and jobs with most risks actually in being affected and becoming sick. Those are the one who are losing all these things less and been benefiting less about the information about Corona. And they communicate less with other elderly or people on the web. So the people who, not, who, who need it most are using it less. And that's of course a problem, isn't it? The another uh, domain is the economy. When I depart now from uh, main thesis about the combined and uneven development of networks related on the economy, digital networks are in fact part of a combined development in the world. The internet, for instance, is using is making the global more combined. Everybody is now talking about COVID crisis. We see the internet is used and ICT in general is used for more uh, cooperation in the world, economically, division of labor in the world, in a globalized economy. It can't work anymore without ICT and networks. Now, what have, for instance, the developing countries have to do with this today? Because they only partly participate in the development and partly are they only marginal in the world economy? Because another thesis, combined and uneven development, we also have core and periphery. periphery. The developing countries are part of the periphery. And in developing countries, you have the, the capitals and the big industrial centers who are the core and the countryside with farmers and the like, it's the periphery. 
What we can see now and using the internet economically, we see that the strongholds are getting much stronger now, but the weaker parts are lagging behind. And this is called uneven development. So while we use all kinds of stuff from China now and all of the world, that's combined, it's the factory of the world today, China. It's also the case that many countries in the world still have an uneven development and they can't cope up with, for instance, China. China is much rising much faster than, than countries in Africa and South America or the like. Then that might be that mobile telephony might be a solution here. That's what people have thought all of the time. Uh, that, for instance, uh, mobile telephony could leapfrog in a, uh, evolution stages via mobile using. But this actually is not working, this, uh, this thesis, in my view. Because what I, my observation in all these countries, in uh, Indonesia and India and the like, is that mobile f f telephone using is very good for, for instance, health communication, uh, uh, um, government communication for all cities when they have a mobile phone, and also for the economy. But there, in the economy, it supports existing business and economic activity. It's very good for local trade and the like, and the own small business, which are already there, but not for innovation. You need to have real innovation to have a bigger, stronger part of the world market, and that's something different. So mobile telephony in the developing world leads to more opportunities for the developing countries. There will be more drown into the network society globally, but at the same time, they are staying at the same place, still being developing and not developed. What are the solutions? In my view, uh, not only mobile telephones in the network and then the developing societies, but also a fixed infrastructure. That's much more expensive, but you don't have a fixed infrastructure everywhere into the homes, but that you can't have a mobile at the local loop. That would be a, a, a good combination. Then you have a good back, back, back of infrastructure of telephony and that the mobile is the local loop. Another solution is, of course, that still traditional development policies are very important in developing countries, like better education, healthcare, transport, electricity, and fighting corruption. Now we have to, to, uh, to apply combined and uneven economic development to the corona crisis. But here's the same story I can tell you. The economic effects of the corona crisis are combined in the whole world. You see in the whole world, recessions, shrinking international cooperation is happening. So people are going more to their own economy. National economy should be strengthened because we can't rely anymore on all this stuff from China or something. This is happening in the whole world recessions, slums, and the like. At the other kind, we see also more unequal developments. We see that the same people are now the victim economically of the corona crisis. Who are the main victims of the corona crisis economically? People with flexible and insecure jobs, jobs in crowd buildings, in public transport, in restaurants, and in cleaning. Those people have a, low, a lot of contact with other people directly, physically, working on the street and the informal economy. Go to Lagos in Nigeria. Well, the informal economy is gone down now because with its lockout, 
over there at home, you see that people have no work anymore at the street. Because they are not allowed to do it or they have no opportunities because people are more at home. We have people who are living in packed housing and communities, even in shanty towns in developing countries, close to each other, while the rich are in big houses, only with a few people. So that's quite a difference. And you have countries which people have no health insurance or even bad health insurance, and that people are all dependent on poor hospitals, poorly ex ex equipped hospitals. And even in the rich country of the world, the United States, you see that why, why, why of the reasons why it's so bad in the corona crisis in the United States is this enormous inequality in that, in that uh, country. The people who have no health insurance just can't go to the hospital even. So the, own, the, their own, the most hospitals are for rich people and for poor people. It's very difficult to get uh, evil to get an entrance into a hospital. So using uh, the effect of the corona crisis leads to even more inequality, unfortunately. Then we go to uh, the political domain. It's the same story. In fact, networks can make us more democratic, our societies. When I started in the 1980s for my research, I did research about tele-democracy, for instance. As a young uh, scholar, I thought, well, this might be the future, that everybody can vote from home. And that time, for instance, already in the 1980s, we had cable television in two directions in Amsterdam. And I had discussions on the in, uh, in, 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 on television and that people at home could have a button and in which that would say yes or no and the like. That was the first start of what at that time called teledemocracy. So I used for opportunities to be more democratic and using the internet. Well, those opportunities are there and they're now much more updated and much better than today. Using the internet, we have all kinds of e-participation tools in the world. But I also wrote a book with my uh, colleague Ken Hacker from the United States. It's called Internet and Democracy in the Network Society. The main conclusion there is that traditional democracy is even under threat and that there was no real uh, transformation of our political systems systems using the internet at this moment. Of course, there are changes, but not actually that we have now more democratic uh, uh, participation, no voter participation in elections, now not more than 30 years ago in general in the world. So those kinds of basic things of democracy have not changed. Instead, what I have to see too is traditional democracy, especially liberal democracy, is under threat. You see in most party of the world, you see that Victorian democracy is replacing liberal democracy. Well, you see it in even uh, in a country close to you, in, in, in Hungary, in Poland, Turkey, not to take a long about uh, Putin, Russia, of course, you know, your history of Litu Lithuania is, of course, more democracy in the last 30 years, of course. But uh, in the same time, you're always under threat of this big bear to the east, isn't it? Anyway, a Torian democracy is also using networks, and that's what I called in my book Networked Autorianism which is based on surveillance. The most advanced country political system of surveillance using is China, of course. 
but many other countries are going up too in the same direction. And even in the United States, they were talking about hacking and interfering and intellection in the United States. Well, the four in 2016, the, 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 the culprits were of course Russia, China, and perhaps Iran, but now it's already the, the, the Republicans and the, the, Met, the Met Democrats themselves. And uh, it's going there. So for instance, it's very frightening that actually so many people, Americans, for instance, at this time think that the world is different than they really is, that there is no Corona crisis and that Trump has won the elections. That's a list, at least 50 million Americans think so, especially also using being the only source is social media. No American reads a newspaper anymore. There are only several channels. And when you're for Trump, you're following Fox News. If you are Democratic, you're following CNN. So there's a complete split. And we see the rise of disinformation, even revealed now to the president of the United States. He himself is now disinforming his country and his populace in an enormous scale. We also see the rise of micro-targeting, that only particular people who are lining to use Democrat or Republican are now be focused by political marketing and manipulation. This is now happening in the whole of the world in advanced uh, democracies. Anyway, we see the tradition of television and press democracy to internet democracy. That's a long evolution that talks about three to four decades. Then we go to internet television and internet uh, democracy, internet democracy will also be algorithm democracy with a much bigger role for technology. Now, in, 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 in 20, 30 years, politics will be all about artificial intelligence, digital marketing, social media analysis, manipulation, and the like. And those have positive idea things and negative. Positive is of course that actually using the big data and artificial intelligence and all the things we know, the governments already know what the populations think about things. They have the data. They know what people think. Actually, you should even think, well, elections are not needed anymore because they already know what the people think. But they don't act on it. That's the problem. They act on their own way, what they want to do. And that's, of course, the other thing. And when they tend to be more autocratic, then we have a problem for democracy in the future. To change all these things, for instance, one of the main things is, of course, we have to change these platforms, these internet platforms, the five big American platforms and the two, three, four big Chinese platforms. Tencent and Alibaba are now competing with governments and power, clearly. Who has the power in society? Clearly, at this moment, governments, but you see now that they have no control anymore of what happens on Facebook, on um, all these platforms today. They try to regulate it now, but it's not successful yet. It will take years and years before they have some hold on what's happening in the social media actually at this moment. Because these platforms tend to be very undemocratic. The problem is that they are not transparent of what they are doing. All their uh, algorithms, all their specific models of business are secret, business secrets, and we don't know why, for instance, your tweet, your post to Facebook will be filtered or not? What is the norm? They make the norm, not the law. They make the law, and that's undemocratic. To change this, a lot of things 
have to be done. I've discussed in the Network Society for what to do about this. Uh, for instance, the Corona crisis and the political domain. This is a picture of uh, the world in which countries have become weaker in uh, democracy or stronger in democracy. According to Freedom House, that's an institution which is in favor of democracy in the world. And it's made a report, report recently, it's called Democracy Under Lockdown. And there's only one country in the world in which it has become stronger in this crisis, and that's Burundi in Africa. I don't know actually why, perhaps it uh, has a better government or something. But most countries in red here have less democracy. They use this crisis to curb democratic rights in all ways, like, for instance, demonstrations, uh, having giving not uh, reliable or good information about the pandemic on the Internet, uh, making disinformation like Trump has done in the United States. And you see here that, for instance, uh, you are countries close to Lithuania, in Poland, politicians making unfounded statements not based on actual data. That's what I told about Poland. When we look at Belarus, well, you don't have to say anything about Belarus today. Uh, Blistened lies, censorship, lack of information control, not to be challenged. All information about the corona is not reliable in this country using on the internet. So for every country there is some uh, some problem and uh, this uh, Freedom House institution has a lot of pillars of uh, democracy. Here are five pillars. Democracy should be transparent, there should be free, de free media, there should be credible elections, there should be checks against abuses of power, protection of uh, uh, vulnerable groups in the world. And in all of these uh, respects, you see today that we have problems. We have, for instance, the transparency is that the, the distrust people have about the government information is increasing. That at this moment, for instance, one third of the population don't want even want a va va vaccination anymore. Well, that would be different 30 years ago, I guess. And that's all on account of disinformation on the uh, Internet. You see restrictions on the social media and the news media. Not everything is allowed. For instance, in China, everything is uh, allowed anything. When we see uh, elections, there was a lot of discussion in, in um, the uh, elections postponed after the Corona crisis. They have been organized differently, like using post votes, like in the United States. That's not wrong, actually, but actually it, it is a change and it is this de debated on whether this is a good thing or not. We see policy, uh, police violence on the streets when people want to give a demonstration that they don't like this lockdown and the like. So it's not only positive about uh, the, the, the democratic um, affairs today in this crisis. The last uh, domain I want to cover today is uh, the network society on demand. That's the cultural thing that our daily media use is changing in using the internet and other digital media. Well, the basis of on demand use is the individualization of the population. This has happened after the Second World in all American and European society. 
using the digital media, this is even reinforced because in using digital media, you can realize network individualization. It means that the individual, the individual is becoming the most important note in our society, especially in Western society, because in Eastern society, it's still the collective who is the most important note. But even in Eastern countries, I've been often in Indonesia and China and the like, and I see that individualization is also happening there. Not that fast as in the Western world, but still there. So it means that the individual is becoming the most important node, and it's also in uh, on the internet with your own profile, personal profile and the like, your own use of digital media at home. You see today, if you look, for instance, to young people, well, they don't look anymore to the eight o'clock news at television, isn't it? Which uh, young people? people from 18 to 20 will will follow this news at eight o'clock as a daily rhythm. No, they have their own demand. They do it all of the time. They have their own messages, services and the like for the news. That's a quite a different type of use of uh, digital media. Well, we have a lot of manifestations of uh, online demand use of digital media. For instance, that all what you are doing all day today, individually, everything we are doing now online and also offline, but that's increasingly integrated. When we as communication star uh, use scientists, we started with the big differences with online and offline. Today, we only have to do to research the integration of online and offline that has been spurred, of course, by the mobile revolution. You see on demand media use that most young people this don't know directly use the time of the television. They do it uh, uh, on, their, on their own times and, and with their own sites they're using for YouTube and the like for nice videos and the like. That's another use of, for instance, television. You see the rise of user generated content. It's not only you're not only reading and listening, you are making your own content. That's possible. And that also means some kind of participatory media culture that uh, people can now uh, engage in traditional media too, that they could link to radio and television shows right, that could uh, sign, send a letter directly uh, to the online newspaper and the like. Those is called participation culture. You see more control over your own sources, contexts and relationships than before. It's not something made for you and you can consume it. You're more active in using all this stuff today. That doesn't mean that it always works because you see that people are really, people are doing the things all of the time the same as they did before for many things, but when they want, they can choose, I hope. And the uh, very big priority of self-presentation is also very important. Uh, and the negative thing is, of course, we see the problem of excessive use of mobile phones, game use on the Internet, social media use. Well, in my country, about uh, one third of young girls is addicted on the social media. According to psychological research, that's a lot, isn't it? A third of it. What's happening in the Corona crisis? Uh, two people are primarily informing themselves and communicate themselves in their own self sovereign ways, in their own social media outlets, their own groups and the like. And only secondary, they are looking for traditional media. Uh, well, 
in this way, they are very fast in getting this information, but it might be also very risky, but uh, you can confront it with disinformation. That's a problem. Traditional media might be more reliable. We don't never know, but they might be more traditional media which are more reliable. I hope so, but uh, relatively more actually than usual social media today. So what's the conclusion so far? We have a common team for all these trends, a common team. And this team is called from, in my books, the law of trend amplification. It's one of the laws of the, the web, of the internet that I described in this book. And this is my own law that I added this to uh, the other ones. The law says that the networks are relational structures that tend to amplify existing social, economic and political trends. And currently two health crises. This means that they cause no total transformation of societies, but is existing societies, existing trends, because our societies still are capitalist, most of them. Others might be state capitalist, like in China. And they are unstable unsta societies, unfortunately. That's what they can say. And you can say they are democratic or authoritarian. Okay, but those are the, in fact, the societies we were before. Only the new media, the internet and the like, only reinforcing trends I discussed. Of course, digital media might be called revolutionary. It's actually a revolutionary, which is called convergence in the last 30, 40 years. This has changed our complete media man scale completely. But if we're looking at the social effects, in my view, there's only evolution, major trends, reinforcing or whatever. Many people say, well, this is the time that things are going so fast, faster than ever before in history, on account of all these technologies and all these media. Well, they're wrong. There was a time in history in which time the things were changing faster. And that's more than 100 years ago in what I call the first communication society when we got motor transport, television, photography, electricity to start with. Those things were more pervasive in our daily life than today, even with the digital media. That's my relative idea about the impact of digital media. In those days, remember that in the 1990s, you have to uh, work up when it was light and you got came to sleep when it's getting dark. There was no electricity. When you go after your house, well, most people don't go more than one kilometers or two. There was no transport. There was no education for everybody, only for the small elite. There were no uh, mass media, no motor transport. All of things were not available in the first revolution after the industrial revolution. That was the big change bigger than the change today. Okay, this was the substantial part of my lecture. The last part of my lecture, and now I have some time left, yeah, is uh, what this means for communication science. Okay. Uh, of course, the means and application of digital media are becoming so pervasive in our society today that everybody's talking about the internet and digital media. They touch every part of daily life, working, schooling, leisure time, social relationships, communities. We are now 
media people for about eight to eight to ten hours a day today, and that's a lot. It is our becoming our life in a big time. So that must be the focus of communication science. I'm not saying that traditional traditional media are not important anymore. They are, but they are changing and they will be linked more and more to the digital media. So in any way, communication scientists have to change their uh, interest of research more in the direction of digital media without losing, of course, their interest in the traditional media, which still are very important today. Uh, what I also observe is that today other disciplines are stealing our domain, our domain of media and also the digital media. Because when I look at uh, discussions in the media and the like, it's always sociologists, political scientists, economics, psychologists, they're talking about the digital media and not social uh, communication scientists. That's very evident today and I want this to be changed. Because these disciplines, these sociologists, these political sciences are dearly missing thing. It's the media dimension. In all their analysis I see they need the media dimension. They have no knowledge and experience about what a medium is and how it works, whether it's traditional or digital. What could be the focus? Well, we can focus on the digital media themselves as channels, as content, more the language perspective. We can look at the users of all these media, traditional and digital. We can look at the design of the media and we can look at the social context. When I tried, I, I started to work in my university and the University of Twente in the year 2000, I saw people who were busy with traditional media only and only with language contents and about design. They were not engaged with digital media, of course, it was that early that time and not at the social context. And I try to add at least that, that means the social context and the digital media perspective. And most of my work is also the users important. But all of these focuses are important in every department of communication. Depends on what focus you uh, want more, but something of all of these things has to be chosen. To combine all these things, you need interdisciplinary communication science. Communication science is all of the time being a communication uh, is an interdisciplinary society already, all from the start actually, but now we need more to touch all communication dimensions of the network society, our focus and perspectives have to become broader, even broader than before, in the direction of more interdisciplinary, without losing our own uh, media and communication focus. That would be a mistake, that losing our media and communication focus. I, I could have been staying only a sociologist without knowing how media really works, but that was not a good solution, Would be, wouldn't have been a good uh, so, uh, solution for me. I also have to uh, focus on media and communication itself, because it's a particular discipline, but an interdisciplinary. An interdisciplinary um, science is not a combination of many disciplines and perspectives. It doesn't mean, well, now we combine psychology, sociology, economy and media. No, it's integration and that's quite different. Interpersonary as integration means 
that you have a particular domain, a particular problem, a particular issue with many aspects to it. And those aspects might be psychological, sociological, cultural and the like. Because nobody can be a specialist in all of these disciplines. That's impossible. But you can be a specialist in a particular domain, an issue, a problem, an issue, and looking for this from particular perspectives, dimensions. That's the interdisciplinary that we'll need. So we need more interdisciplinary, indeed. And we have to know what is actually our contribution on this domain, other than the socialist and the psychologist say. The second thing, what I envisage is, is that uh, we have to be more technical. And that's most of us, our colleagues don't like, but we, they have to be more quantitative in many things, because this is the, how the technology works. The opportunity is that we have the data already in many domains on the internet, in official statistics. There are so many data in the society. We don't have to do it ourselves anymore to collect them. So it seems, but that's not true, but so it seems. But actually you can use it, but then you need the techniques to use it. You need to know something about social media analysis about smart uh, projects, about uh, big data, more or less. No, you don't have to be uh, interfacial intelligence programming. You don't have to be social program. You have to be not a social uh, programmer, but you actually have to know how it works. How works artificial intelligence, for instance? Now, it's very uh, striking that, for instance, in the Netherlands, we have now the first preferences preferences in communication science, which are called II, II, artificial intelligence and communication. That was um, unimaginable only 10 years ago, but now this is coming and there will be professorships of big, big data and communication too, and social media and analysis and communication too. This is the evolution and you don't have to be a mathematician, you don't have to be a statistician only, but you have to know actually how it works. And the basic of things have to be known by all staff, I'm afraid. The last uh, thing I imagine is there will be more uh, focus on vision, strategy and solutions for all these effects of the digital media, which are so important for our uh, society, backed by theory, to have a say in all these discussions, so that there is some discussion in, um, on, in the press or on television or on social media, that communication scientists have their own views. They are specialists too. They should be spe specialists about the digital media too. Uh, what are the research strategies we need in this uh, situation? More first, network analysis and social media analysis, which unfortunately is rather quantitative and rather formal, might be even mathematical, statistic. That's true, it can't happen, but this so. Only the second thing is what I focus is still qualitative research, because with all using all these trends I uh, described about networks and the like, which you can uh, research uh, quantitative, you need the qualitative perspective too, because you can have formal network analysis about relations and nodes and edges and the like, but this is so formal that the informal part of it how people are perceive what's happening in a network and what they're doing, you need qualitative research. For instance, I did a lot of quantitative research about the digital divide, but now I have PhDs. We are going to families at home and to, to observe how they are working the internet. And that is important because this is the perspective. We found, for instance, that people 
uh, families with high education and people with low education families are completely different in using the internet and in ra raising their children in the internet. Completely different. This is something you don't find only with quantitative research. And other things is we have to use more official statistics and content analysis of web content because everything is available now today and even freely without without cost only you have to deal with it you need to turn it to the techniques to, to deal with them and then that's a big opportunity because you don't need the money you only need your techniques and your time we, we will have more online service and perhaps we will hiring agencies for offering panels. That's what we do in my university too. Well, it costs 5,000 euro, but then you have, for instance, that's not 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 much, I can tell you, for, uh, for a representative panel of the uh, Dutch population, five to 10 euro, thousand euro. You can do it. And that's much cheaper than before. We also need lab and field experiments when we have to do MIDI designs and to show which work better than others. And for instance, what we've done of performances, how people perform on the internet with observation in a lab of their digital skills, really demonstrating what are your skills. And you need vision, strategy and solutions. That's of course in my focus, my special individual's focus. I think communication scientists should participate more in national policy discussions about the effects of the digital media. And their input should be first be their own theory, their own empirical data and explicit societal values, which is called ethics. When we look, when we read my book, The Network Society, you can see I have explicit values about all the stuff I'm discussing. That's about all the domains of society, freedom, control and democracy, social equality, sustainability, safety, quantity and quality of social relationships and richness of communication and the human mind which is our thing, of course. And uh, this is the way I perceive all these things I talk today. So this is now my lecture. And now I hope that I'll get a lot of questions, please, please. Um. So dear audience, uh, come up with questions or comments. You had time to reflect. Yeah. Actually, while people are getting ready with questions, I have one. Uh, uh, I was interested in your comment about um, uh, the role of communication scientists and their unique contribution. Uh, and what I thought, actually, it's very difficult because uh, communication science itself is very interdisciplinary. We use uh, theories by psychologists and sociologists and some communication science theories migrate to other fields. Yeah. So how uh, how to show our identity if uh, our focus on, on media features is enough or are there any uh, different way to prove our, our identity as uh, communication scientists? Well, that means that you have to relate to what, for instance, these sociologists, psychologists and political scientists say. You have to relate to what they say and say, don't forget the media dimension. Those are properties or characteristics of media and the use of these media by people that you have forgotten. Or for instance, you have to know, for instance, you can take a can have a lot of um, discussion about what is the effects of social media on communities and the like. But the problem is how people are using a digital medium to communicate in communities. 
that's the user, the user of the media, and how I am using it in other ways than in other ways that the minds on the design of the application, the relation of the design of the application, the use by the user in a context, that is the focus of communication science. And that is something missing very often when I see all these splendid analysis of sociolo sociologists and the like. They forget about the media dimension. Media is a particular reality. It is a particular technology. It's a particular tool, application, and it's an environment too. And they forget about the media dimension, both the properties of media, the, the, the design of the media, the use of the media, the culture use of the media. That's what I forget. And when you have something to say about this, they have to have to expand their analysis of these sociologists, political scientists and the like. Thanks a lot. And we have a raised hand from Elana, please. Uh -huh. OK, um, I agree with you totally that the technology does not really change the society. It is as it is. It is capitalist. But the society definitely affects technology and what happens with it and also what happens with media. And um, these five big companies in ICT, they are not the only ones big. The media ha went the same way after the market uh, media market was deregulated. So we have Bertelsmann, we have Turner, we have God knows who huge companies and it's practically impossible to find out who owns who. And most probably it all goes to two, three hands. So how to change this? How to resist this these huge companies because it's really difficult to, anything that goes up comes up interesting in technology field or in the media it's immediately bought up by these big companies and becomes part of them so i'm sort of at the moment uh, slightly sort of discouraged and desperate how do you change the situation in ICT and in media. Yeah. Are there any possible ways to do that? Well, I think they are, but uh, it's uh, more difficult than about uh, traditional media. We still have big, uh, me big media in the traditional uh, domain too. You, you told some like Turner and the like, those very big one. A lot of them, you've seen them. But now we have, for instance, the big te tech uh, plot platforms and the like, and those are different, are working different than those old mass media before, both in a capitalist environment, but that depends on what are the characteristics of these platforms and how can they mobilize what's happening on uh, the internet. You have to know how this works, otherwise you cannot make any uh, regulation and no advice for politicians because what we see now I see all these discussions in parliaments and set in the Congress in the United States and the like all these congressmen really don't know how it works those platforms they don't know how they work and they think that for instance by competition uh, uh, solutions they say when we make those big companies smaller, split them, for instance, that that would be a solution. But it's not. It's not a solution at all. Competition uh, uh, revolution is not enough, and certainly not by making bigger companies smaller. Because in a network society, everything is linked to the cadre. So smaller companies together can be very big too. That's a network perspective, but that's what these uh, politicians don't know. And that's also what other social scientists also don't know. And that is something that, for instance, media people, digital people who know about how these platforms work, they can give them better advices, but first they have to know how it works. 
And when our people, our own communication scientists and media people don't know themselves how it works, then we have a problem. There will be other solutions for the digital media, big platform monopolization, and for the traditional monopolations of television and the press. Those were relatively easy, but the, what we need now is much difficult uh, things, much difficult. And this is the reason why it takes so long before we got now this resolution. There's, there's still no solutions, not in the European Union, not in America, not in China. That's a different situation, of course. I think there will be many laws that have to change to be uh, to account what's happening in the social media, for instance. Not simple competition rules against population, but also uh, what is allowed as speech on the internet and what is not allowed. What are the norms? Then you have to change the law, uh, for instance, laws which are more uh, look uh, for uh, contents of the web because the web is not the same as a book or something and how it works and that's those are things that we know how how that works what what the properties are and how different they are and that it might lead to other what means free speech on the internet what means free speech in books and newspapers that's different and we can show these people what are the differences and what this means for the law? And there's more than economic laws which have to be changed, especially cultural law, uh, laws about uh, free exp expression, free writing, copy copy copyrights and the like. All these things have to be changed. <laughs> when we have a, a updated law about these things of digital media and expression, then we can uh, give self-regulation for the social media, that big center, in a framework of the law, the new law, updated law for the digital media, and then they can do it themselves, but they have to be transparent. They should be accountable for what they're doing, and there will be institutions which will see what they are doing, why they have filtered particular posts, and not other posts, for what norm? If that norm was not in operation, according with the law, then they have a problem. When they're inside the law, the updated new law, then it will be a problem. So it's not the, I don't hope for a future within the government says what, what happens on the internet. That's what we happening now in China. That's not a solution. You'll need a updated good uh, uh, laws about media, expression, cultural, all those things, which can be uh, applied by those platforms and their users with much more uh, uh, um, participation of the users, more rights of the users, much more than today in Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and the like, much more rights for the users that they can complain when things are going wrong, when a particular post is filtered, why and why not, that they can have a complaint and the like. That This is my picture of in very in general how it should work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So it's more to build up a very good lobby for the yeah. To make the laws and to counteract the big businesses lobby. Yes, yes, yes. When the laws happens. should be better, be, be updated because most of them are out finch, finch, out fashioned. They're still of the age of television, of radio and the newspaper. And this is a new uh, media and most uh, laws are not good enough for coping with all these problems in the digital media, for instance. For instance, now we get uh, the problem of fake news and uh, deep fakes even that videos have been manipulated. How can we solve this big problem of the future? Hmm? Then you know how it works. 
you first have to know how it works. And then can you say, how, how, how can you change this? There's all this fake news uh, trends and f manipulated videos and Facebook and the like. It seems we have one more question from the audience. Vincent, you raised your hand. Please come up with your question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I just want you to, to uh, add a discussion to, uh, about uh, comp complaints to big uh, media companies. In my point of view, nobody will complain or only minority. Like you, Elena, Huzinaida, those who make research in the field, etc. But the majority of users don't care about how information is filtered, etc., etc. They just use it and they will use it as long as it is uh, uh, for free, without uh, any payment, etc. Unfortunately, that's rightly true. That's for for the majority. It is at this moment not a big problem, and they're doing what they want. They think. But the problems are growing now. For instance, in my uh, society, there's a, a, society, a discussion about uh, having a black peat that uh, has to do something with uh, Santa Claus. And that's supposed to be a, 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 a racist uh, image. And there were big demonstrations against big peat and traditional traditions before Pete, because these are traditional customs. What happens is that, for instance, uh, Facebook has filtered all messages with Big Pete. And there were many uh, users which were very afraid, very uh, angry about this move. And Facebook get no any uh, legitimation for this filtering. They're doing that on their own count, on their own view. So this is the first start of this kind of people that people are really having a problem with this censorship, which will going on and on and on on the internet. For instance, in America, you see now the problem that many Republicans don't like that uh, the, the tweets of Donald Trump has been uh, treated by Twitter. There's now, uh, well, this is not true or so, a label to it. And so you see that the discussion is now starting. I know at this moment people are using the internet and the, uh, the platforms like they want, and it seems to work. Like my students, they don't want another Facebook, which cost uh, a subscri subscription of five euro, which might be better because it works for them sufficiently. So I think uh, in the future this will change, I hope. Thank you. Any more thoughts and questions? Uh, not yet. Then I will use my opportunity. Actually, I thought um, about digital divide I'm very interested in. And I thought that we are going much uh, more and more unequal with digital technology. On the other hand, there are also very inspiring uh, examples. Uh, for instance, um, I think maybe 10 years ago already, there was an experiment by Sugata Mitra, uh, hole in the wall. In India, he uh, installed a computer and children could uh, learn, although illiterate, but uh, with high motivation, they learned on their own. And then he launched the idea of uh, uh, school in the cloud, so uh, how can we learn, or maybe the, are there any more examples that could make us learn and use uh, this um, amplifying tendency on the positive side? Oh, there are many opportunities of positive science, especially for education. And I've seen so much examples in developing countries. I was in China, Chile and Tunisia, and uh, I was in classes and saw how people are using the internet and it's very, very positive. Well, this is uh, an issue for education scientists, most of the time developing uh, scientists, and they know about these opportunities. And uh, most of the time they are very positive and they are in f before they, they like it. But the problem is that so so 
So less people, children, are using it. It's just a minority phenomenon. We only have the official education and sometimes, of course, it is very important for classes today to use the digital media and it's happening everywhere in the world. And there are a lot of very positive things and, and, and many children like to use iPads and the like and all these opportunities. Of course, it's their, their own world. The problem is uh, either that the world of children today at home using mobile phones, games and the like is completely different than the work of the class at school in which not that media are used. So it might be better that they use more of these digital media and the positive things at schools. That's my advice everywhere I have been that there would be a link to the, uh, the reality of young people on the internet at home in leisure time and what they're doing at school. And then they can learn things which are good and wrong on the internet to discuss them on class. Yeah, that they are bullying or whatever and that they have problems with this and this and then the teacher can help them and the, the rest of the class too. I think we had a very uh, nice discussion on that uh, during last year's conference uh, where there was an educator who actually uh, performed a large scale research with observing children and how they use uh, digital media for constructing their own, their own stories. And it seems that really, if we look how child develop uh, knowledge of the world with computers and look at their playtime, we can uh, really have, I think, more effect. In, yeah. in there should oh. be a link to a class and your own leisure time as for children. That would be very good. Yeah. And so, I see one more hand, Vince. Thank you. I have uh, another question. Uh, up till now, we had a uh, lot of free access to news media. But actually, now we have more and more news media channels which move to subscription, uh, subscription model, even in Lithuania. And they say it will help them to create uh, good quality content, etc. But it happened uh, this equal uh, right to information or uh, something like that with uh, some free information and good quality information in the future. Well. Yeah, discussion today is more and more that free is not really free, that actually you get gab garbage uh, as content. So increasingly, we have to pay very long uh, amounts of money to get the good things. And when we can use it in education for children and the like, there would be some uh, investment in, in good applications and not applications only which are free and which are corrupt or not quality, have no quality. So in the future, people will say good information costs something and not that much as the big tick I want to talk about. Now we have to pay by advertisement, but in, in the future, I hope we will pay for contents and so much that everybody can, can have it available for everybody because it's not that high. But it shouldn't have be high because network effects say actually when you have a lot of users, it doesn't have to be expensive at all. It doesn't have to be. When you have a good application for children for school, it, it might be um, uh, five euro uh, a month or something, and that's I I I think that could be enough for for a, for a class or for a school. That could you could they could pay that just like they had to pay for books uh, before. Thank you, Vince, and thank you, Jan. Any more questions, comments, reflections? OK, it seems we have a lot of topic to reflect on our own. Um, I would like to thank Jan for being with us today. 
uh, for telling so many interesting points and giving us so many uh, interesting perspectives. And I think uh, many of them quite coincide with our own thoughts. Um, so I, I suppose uh, this uh, lecture is a kind of discussion for us all, for our own role as communication scientists in these processes, but uh, I'm very delighted that we have a lot of opportunities, yes, to join multidisciplinary team and to show uh, that our perspective, media perspective is important. Yeah, I know. I know you have a lot of opportunities to do this, but you only have to act to it. <laughs> That's, uh, it's a yes, lot of work so actually. You have to change. So I, I, I try to do that in my, all of my life because I, I started my PhD with an electric type machine and never touched a computer at all. And I was only 30 years or something. Afterwards, I have to learn everything. So it can be. It can everything be. is possible. Everything is possible. And when my uh, my lecture would be very negative, it was critical. I my own uh, motivation for investigating the digital media is the opportunities. That's where I started in the 1980s with all these opportunities. These are still there, but they also found we have some negative trends, and they have to, we have to cope with it because it's now difficult on the internet. Since about five years ago, there's much discussion about the negative effects on the internet, what's happening on the internet, not only the positive, and the, the, the big hype of internet of 2000 is over. Yes, but still it seems um, this discussion is not going to an end and we will have to observe how um, these trends unfold in future but yeah. at this at this point of time i would like uh, to thank ian okay. for being with us i yeah. hope it is not the last time and maybe we will um, proceed to more interactive formats in future yeah then uh, i can go more uh, in focusing of what people really like because i don't know you actually all your Colleagues, uh, what are your main teams? What are you looking for? And uh, <laughs> I have my own uh, 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 my own story today, and not yours. <laughs> okay, but we have to start with something. Yeah. So, thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you, colleagues, for being here virtually, yeah. and I hope we will meet more. So, have a great evening. Me, you uh, too, and a good. Uh, Weekend too, yeah. And yeah. then I hope we meet in future. Goodbye. Uh, in real life. In real life. Yeah, yeah exactly. So <laughs> I've never seen films. I've never seen films. <laughs> never before. <laughs> okay. I hope we will arrange this in future. So have a nice evening and okay. goodbye. Same to you all you. Okay. See you next time. Thank you. Hi. Thank Hi. you. Hi. Thank you. Oh, yeah. See you. Thank you, Ian. Okay, see you. Well, stop.